episode of Inside the Recording Studio. My name is Jody Whitesides, and with me, as always, is Mr. Chris Hellstrom. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing wonderfully well, Jody. How are you? I'm doing pretty well, too, except for a shoulder issue. Yeah? Yes. Limited yeah, mobility not, is, is coming same my sh- way, which is not fun. Is it the same shoulder as before, or is yes. this a different shoulder? Same shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Sorry, yeah. man. I'm thinking on yeah. Tuesday I might find out that I'm going to have to go in for an MRI and then possibly go in for surgery because shit just sounds wrong in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sounds a little bit like a cement grinder when you move your shoulder there? Uh, not so much cement grinder as little clicks and pops and then some squishiness. And it's like, I don't Ooh. think the squishy thing is supposed to really be there along with the clicks and pops. <laughs> yeah. Is, is my shoulder supposed to do this? Yeah. <laughs> Am I, have I got my DAW set to the wrong setting inside my shoulder? Damn it. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, let's. you've already steered us onto the right path here. So we're going to leave health issues aside Yes. in the name of oversharing here. Correct. Are you ready to get nerdy today, Jody? I think everybody needs to strap in to their nerd seat and put on a helmet because here we go. (laughs) It's, yeah. Hold on tight. It might get nerdy today. Hopefully we'll all come out. It's not even a mic thing. We're going to get nerdy. We're talking about pan laws today and that's nerd level shit right there. Before we dive, you know, head first into the pool of pan laws and what it means and what it does. We want to touch on first, obviously, the very, very basics of mixing, I think, where we're dealing with levels on a fader and panning anywhere from hard left to hard right. Or center. Or center. Or somewhere in between. Yeah, that would be center, right? (laughs) (laughs) All right, we're off the rails. But that's that's the basics of mixing. Before we even start thinking about EQs and compressors and everything else that we have at our disposal, that's the basics for what we do. But when it comes to panning, as you said there in the intro, we have something called a pan law. Yes. What is a pan law and how much jail time do you get for breaking it? (laughs) You go directly to you don't get to mix shit anymore if you fuck this up. No, just kidding. Yeah, not quite that serious, right? But basically what it comes down to is how your DAW deals with A mono source, not only a mono source, but I'm going to start with a mono source as it gets panned to the right or to the left and what happens to the level of that signal. It's not just DAWs that do this. Hardware consoles do it too. Yes. And that's actually where it comes from. So I think it's a little bit ironic that that is something that was actually implemented into DAWs because obviously it doesn't have to be. I, no, it doesn't but, have to be. Uh, However, that being said, if we were to go entirely down your rabbit hole of saying, why did they implement this? Why do they actually do recreations of hardware for plugins? It does exactly. make sense that they're using the idea of pan laws from consoles in DOS. It's just a little bit weird. I get you. Yeah, it is absolutely true because somebody that has spent the majority of their career, let's say, in front of a console, whether that's a Neve or an API or an SSL or what have you. Harrison, Trident, it, yeah. Whatever. If they're finding themselves sitting in a DAW and they're they're applying their skill set that they've acquired over the years, now the panning doesn't behave the same way. So that that would be odd, right? Yes. So instead of having to sort of like learn a new medium, I suppose, mm-hmm. it, I'm assuming that's why it was implemented as well. Should we dive in just to talk about? Actually, I think we should start about just what are some common values when we're dealing with pan laws, and then. We'll break that down and talk about what what they actually do. Sound like a plan? That's the plan. I like it. All right. Start us off, Jody. What we got? Common pan law values in most DAWs, not all Mm -hmm. DAWs, but most DAWs, will start at zero, which means there is no pan law. Right. You just do what you do and you're done. You don't have to worry about it. with the original Pro Tools, they had a pan law of minus 2.5. And then this is where we start getting into the most common of all DAWs is a pan law of minus three. Yep. Then we have pan laws based on minus 4.5 and a pan law of minus six. And all of these are dB values, not just numbers. Right. And then to top it off, to get even more crazy, there's oftentimes two different settings for the pan laws, especially around minus three and minus six. 
Yeah, Some of you have it at like minus four and a half. Yes, based yeah, on the application. But, Those differences in the application of the PAN law in, say, logic, it's considered to either have the number minus three, minus four and a half, minus six, and then they have another option where it's minus three compensated, minus 4.5 compensated, minus six compensated. In other DAWs, it's going to be known as the power sine cosine or the constant power. So it might say right. minus three power sine cosine or minus three constant power and so on for the other settings. Did we mention that this is going to get nerdy yet? <laughs> <laughs> So how do we go about defining these then? Well, that's really the crux of it. I mean, it's different applications of doing a very similar thing. Yes. So if we start with just no pound law, just zero, when you have a mono sine wave at a constant level coming into your DAW, when on a console in the past, when you would pan further to the left or further to the right away from the center, the signal will be perceived as dropped. It gets lower in value. However, qualify that by saying it depends on the console. Not all consoles did that. Right. But that, that was sort of like the most common attribute, I believe, that it was some level. And that just had to do, deal with the electronic components that were in consoles yes. at the time. So I think it was just, you know, a byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. When you have a pound law of zero, like you mentioned before, you are not affected by this. When you have it in your DOS set at zero, you got that same signal, you're panning it to the left and the right, the perceived volume is going to stay the same. It's the same to our ears at that zero. I'm not sure that it would be the same as a perceived volume level, but the actual volume level would stay the same. The perception does change. Uh, that, that, that's a good point because depending on, you know, oh, it's only coming into my, you know, left ear now or right ear, that type of thing. So that, that's a very valid point. I yes, and this is where will... pan law gets really nerdy is because the idea of changing the pan law is how we change that perceived volume level in our ears when things right. get panned. So now the different values here aim to sort of compensate for that. Yes. So I'm going to jump straight to the minus three, which I think is a little bit more of a common one than the 2.5. I, I think that's probably not even the default setting in Pro Tools these days. Any of you Pro Tools listeners will correct me on that, I'm sure, if I'm wrong. <laughs> but now if we have a minus three, what is going to happen is that when you pan out to the sides, away from the center, your level on the meter will rise up by up to 3 dB when you're hard left and hard right, away right. And from the center, to sort of compensate for that. Let's qualify uh, that, because you're just saying it's minus three. Now, that would be mm -hmm. in logic's definition, it's minus three uncompensated. The Correct. sides go up. In other DAWs, that is considered minus three constant power. Right. Very good point. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can tell, this gets hairy pretty quickly. But then we have different values, right? So the same is true then for minus 4.5 or minus 6. The same thing. It's just that the level changes is going to be more drastic the further to the sides you go away from the center. Right. right? And you're talking so about you have, when it's uncompensated in logic uncompensated. And, and it's constant power in other DAWs. It is... The value of your signal in center mode mm -hmm. is whatever the actual volume level is. And when you pan out to your hard left or your hard right or somewhere in between that hard left and hard right, your volume level on your sides is actually going up. Correct. So just to throw out a value, if you have a, a signal that comes in at minus nine and you have a pound law uh, set at minus three at constant power, when you're panning out to the side, it would go up to six or minus six on your fader. So we're coming from a minus nine, you're bringing it out, it will now land at minus six. So it's gone up three dB in level. Correct. Out to the sides, yeah. What about the other version of that when it's compensated? Well, we call, we call that logic, compensated the, in logic and we call it constant yeah. sine or cosine in yeah. other DAWs. Right. It's a little different. In that 
you have your actual volume level, let's say you're using a sound signal is minus six is your actual volume level of your signal mm. and your panned hard right or hard left. That's the volume level. You'd see it at minus six, but with constant power or uncompensated in logic, as you bring it center, it comes down the value of your pan law. So if you're at minus six on your sides and then you go up to center, you're going to be looking at minus nine if you're at minus yeah. three pan law, or you're going to go to minus 12 if you're at minus six. It sounds really weird. It almost sounds like, hey, it's doing the exact same thing. It is, but it isn't. Because if you started at center and you knew that you had a 6 dB volume level coming in, but it's reading at minus 9 if your pan law is set to minus 3. See how hurry this gets real quick if you start talking different pan laws? <laughs> yeah. But, but so, what we should – this is probably a good time to say that this week we will do a Tuesday tip on this just yes. so that you, you can hear Visually and see, see exactly. it and hear it. So I guess the way to – sort of think about this is it is very much sort of doing the same thing, but when we have the the compensated or the, the cosine, you can think of the hard left and hard right as your main level, if you will, like the incoming level, if that, and when you're bringing it into the middle, it gets dropped. The other version with the constant power is that the volume gets louder as you go out to the side. Where your main level is at your center point. Correct. It is hairy, but it's all these different values that, that we have available. Well, let's take a word from our sponsors right now. All right, we're back. We're going to start discussing why is this important to think about your pan law settings? Why don't you kick us off here, Chris? Well, the first thing I want to bring up, quite possibly it isn't, because if you're the one starting a project, you're doing all the recording, you're doing all the mixing, it really just comes down to like how you mix and you get the sound coming out, the speakers, the way you want it. However, once you are doing the mix down, you might want to be aware of just mono compatibility as well. Because it can do that, right? Once it kind of collapses, you can get perceived higher level and everything because every the sides come in, right? Uh -huh. And it, your pound law will have an effect of that when you can flattening it out to mono as well. The idea here is that it's always a good idea to check your mono compatibility so that yeah. you understand how your stereo sounds or your sounds that are panned hard left, hard right are coming across in the mix if your signal source is some sort of mono signal source, which means you're listening to it on a phone out of the phone speakers, or you're at a club and you're not standing between the two towers of speakers that might be blasting you in the face and blowing your hair back. Or if you're talking about broadcast TV and you're coming through a single ear speaker instead of like a surround system, all of these things become methods of where your final product is going to be listened to and hypercritical of how it actually comes across to the listener. That's why it's a good idea to check your mixes in mono mode to find out how everything collapses down because it can change hardcore based on your pan law. Yeah. And that was something that, I mean, a few years ago, if somebody had told me like, yeah, you got to make sure you check your mixes in mono. I'm like, what are you talking about? But it's actually almost ironic that more people are probably listening to mono versions of songs today than ever before because of where we hear them and consume them. And now also with the way people are listening to, you know, a single Bluetooth speaker type mm -hmm. of thing where, you know, the perception of stereo isn't there. Right. right? And when you're talking it, it, about like the HomePod, the HomePod mini, the Alexa, exactly. the Google speaker, yeah. these are all mono sources most of the time. Although a few of these companies have set up the ability that you can turn them into stereo. Fun fact, most people actually don't sit in front of their speakers in a triangle to listen to your music. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we all wish they, they would sometimes because then they can see how brilliant we've done with the mix. And the but, panning. Yeah. Oh, and all that. All right. So so that that's mono compatibility. And it's sometimes it actually doesn't matter if you're doing the the whole project. But what if I've tracked a song here and I'm 
I've got it kind of a rough to where I kind of like it, but now I decide, now I'm going to send this to Jody so that you can mix it. Sure. And we don't have the same pound law. Well, we may not even have the same DAW, or I might choose to use a different DAW than what you tracked in. So you send me the multi-tracks. And at that point, you have a concept and you've sent me maybe a rough layout of your levels. And yeah. I go put that rough layout of levels based on the multi-tracks that you have sent me. And I've got it in a different DAW or even the same DAW with a different pan law setting. And it goes back to you and you're like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> what, what did you do to my mix, man? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Also, you're going to see what I did initially, and then you're going to stop taking my phone calls, right? But, <laughs> uh, but it is something to, to, I mean, all joking aside, obviously, when you're collaborating, it's something to, to keep in mind when you're doing that. Because if somebody has a different pound law in their DAW, they're going to experience what you just sent them differently than what you hear in your head, what you did on your end. So in that case, it's just as much as sample rate and bit level and all that kind of stuff. I would say the pound law has to be there as well when you're collaborating. So you, you get the accurate reproduction of what it is that you're doing. Yes. So any other reasons what you think? Well, I mean, th those are pretty overhanging reasons right there, obviously. So they're the big reasons. However, why yeah. would you choose, say, either a zero pan law, which very few people probably actually do, or a minus three or a minus four and a half or a minus six? Do you have any idea why you would choose any of those different numbers? Well, I think one part can be just actually up front is I think most people aren't aware of it like, right. at all. Like, is, it's, uh, no, this is what's said in my DAW, and they have to go digging into their preference, you know, <laughs> hierarchy to, to, to set that. But, there, I mean, it could be the, um, the case of where, you know, oh, I'm trying to emulate on a really hardcore nerd level what an old console did, yes. for example. I believe, and again, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but I believe that the primary British consoles, or two of them anyway, like SSL and Neve had a pound law of like minus 4.5. Yes. So if you really want to get nerdy, and that's what we're talking about this today, because of <laughs> course you do, <laughs> if you're adding all your, you know, your your Neve emulations and everything on this, maybe that's something you want to consider as well. I right. Don't know. So that, that would be one more reason why you might want to do that. Yeah. The other thing that I mentioned a little bit earlier here with the concept of your pan law and checking for mono compatibility. When I mentioned like different things where it's a club or your mobile phone or your tablet or your television, when you're definitely most likely to get some sort of mono output, the general thought process is, is that minus six is considered to be the best one, which is constant power, so that your sides go up by 6 dB when you pan them out. That way, when things collapse down, they're supposed to sound a little bit more uniform as to the level that you originally set it to on the sides when it gets broken down into mono. That right. is the general thought process. Now, does everybody use minus six? Hell no. And when we talk about it in terms of settings, especially in logic, where it's fairly easy to set it, but it is set based on a per project basis. It's not set yeah. on the DAW preferences. Now, other right. DAWs actually are more likely to set it based on the DAW itself and not on the preference of the individual song file. However, it does make sense that it's the individual song file because when you go from one Logic Studio to another Logic Studio, you're going to have the same pan law because it's baked into your session file. With Luna, yeah. it's a little different. Luna gives you no choice. It's take set it and like yeah, it. Yeah, you take it as to what it is and you like it and you're done with it. Now, my understanding is, is that from my initial test, Luna is minus six. And when you pan out, the sound goes up. Now they've started doing the extensions with the Neve summing bus and the API console and the API summing buses. So when you use either of those, your pan law changes. Thus, if you are going to use 
a cross section of whether you're using an API summing bus oh, and dear, a Neve yeah. pu- summing bus, you're getting two different pan laws right there. Wow. When you think about it, that's kind of crazy that you would do that within a DAW, but it could be done where you could use Neve summing on some channel strips and API summing on other channel strips. And you're now dealing with two different pan laws. It's yeah. crazy shit right there. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It's really interesting. It is really sort of nerd level. My advice, though, for what it may be worth is don't worry too much about it, but know what it is and make sure that when you're collaborating, have the same kind of pound law. Or if you don't, just don't get thoroughly bent out of shape until you ask whether or not you're using the same versions of things, whether you have the same pan laws going. Because, I mean, all of these little things add up to when you're, I mean, ultimately it's how you kind of push your faders and things. But we can wonder, well, well, I panned something to the left and it kind of disappeared on me, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's where knowing your pan laws can, you know, help. And also, one thing that we just brought up. You just brought up something that's actually a really good point. If somebody has their pan law set and they don't understand what the pan law is doing. And they're like, man, it sounded so awesome in the center. And then I suddenly panned it to the left or the right. And it, as you said, disappeared. That Mm. means that they're using power sign, cosine, or uncompensated levels. And the volume is going to drop when it goes to the side. Yeah. Whereas if somebody's like going, man, when I pan this shit, it gets super loud. What the fuck? It, yeah. It, they're using the opposite going up where it's going amount. up by right. the same amount. So, Yeah. And these are also things to keep in mind that when a practical application with this, where, where I think most people can kind of relate to, mm-hmm. is if you have a part that is moving in your mix, let's say that you have a sound that is going from left to right. You want to pay attention to this kind of stuff so that it doesn't disappear. If you want it to have like the same value as it comes across, that's why this kind of stuff gets important as well. Yes. So, you know, it it doesn't disappear too bad when it goes hard one way or the other. Or it doesn't come up too loud is another thing to think about. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. It just, yeah, as soon as I get to the center, it's 6 dB louder. What the heck happened? Right. Well, and another thing to think about that takes it, a step beyond in the nerd level is the value of the volume level as it changes. And there's a common thread where people might say, well, 3 dB means it's twice as loud. Well, that's not technically true. 3 dB gets you twice the energy level, but it doesn't mean it's twice as loud. Then 6 dB is you're doubling the RMS value but that's still not twice the perceived loudness. It is generally thought that at 10 dB of volume difference is when things perceivably become twice as loud or half as loud for every 10 dB volume change. So Hmm. minus three, minus six, and all of that kind of plays into that where you're doubling either the energy level or doubling the RMS level. Nobody's really doing a pan law of minus 10 that I'm aware of. <laughs> that's <laughs> pretty could drastic. you imagine that? It's like, that'd be super drastic. So yeah. that's another reason to think about your choices of like, am I going minus three? Am I going minus four and a half and kind of getting in between the double energy and double RMS? Or if I'm going full minus six and going double RMS on that value. Yeah, there's all these little things that I think the biggest takeaway with this is when you you notice that that things are either getting lost to the extremes in the left or the right, or if they get too loud in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's just to kind of be aware of of that in your pan law settings. But ultimately, from my perspective, is that don't worry too much about it, but kind of set one and adjust to that to make sure that you know that that works for your workflow. It's not going to make or break you. Nobody's going to go like, oh, dude, you're not mixing at minus 4.5. What the hell, man? You suck, <laughs> you know? Ultimately, no, I don't think anybody's ever said, ooh, you know, that song would have been so much better if they had a different pan law setting. You know? <laughs> so, Could you imagine, though? Somebody might be able to tell that difference. Well, would they, though? Because it really always comes down to levels. Like, how, how far is the fader pushed up or down, mm-hmm. right, for something to bring a present to the mix? So. You know, there are obviously ways around that. You could automate the level if you're 
pounding it hard left and hard right. If it bugs you, you know, there's different ways of getting it, getting around it. But right. well, that being said, yes. What is your pan law setting? I've generally always been minus three compensated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I've never really worried about it. It's just what, what I've had set in logic. I think it was the default at one point. I've just never, I've, I'm just kind of used to it. I mean, in logic, we have other things when it comes to panning that are, I want to say weird the way it's implemented. It's been corrected now or at least given options now, but that is when we have the, the stereo pan or the balance pan right. of, of like stereo tracks. Mm -hmm. that, that creates more issues than the pan law, I think, in logic. And other DAWs deal with it differently. Like, of course, Pro Tools on the stereo track, they have two knobs to adjust the, the panning. Right? Yeah. Luna has the same um, sort of thing. If you have a stereo track, you've got a left knob and a right knob, and you can pan various versions of them. Or see, you I have like the that. option of creating a simple pan knob, which just does the same thing as the two of them, but it keeps everything balanced between left and right. Yeah, I like that. I like that implementation. Now, of course, we have the stereo and the balance both in Logic, but mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the little bit of a, a clunky implementation. I would have liked to have had two, but anyway, I'm not going to learn a new DAW just for that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now last Lee here, I suppose, I would like to bring up one more thing where we have talked in the past and you read it on forums and things every once in a while, perhaps less now, but that's people are debating the sound of DAWs. Sure. Right? It's like, oh, I think XYZ DAW sounds better than ABC, right? And the only thing that really changes in a DAW possibly is the pan law setting. So it could be that when people are experiencing differences between DAWs, if they're going in between DAWs and they have different pan laws at the mixing stage, that could very well be it. Sure. Now, that's, of course, technically not true. You know, no DAW has a sound except, you know, if it starts with L and ends with A. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I wouldn't In the say way that, that that DAW has a sound either. No, it really doesn't. It, but, you know, with the test that you have done and that I've heard, it does It does do something different things when it comes to the mathematics of the plugins, but that doesn't mean the DAW yeah. itself actually has a sound. No, it no. If you import a file into Luna or any other DAW and just play it back, it's going to sound identical. But but that, I think that that could be perhaps a um, a place where this sort of like saying or rumor rather got started, where perhaps in the day when Pro Tools was stuck at minus two point five, and other DAWs might have been at three or what have you, that that could have been a, a real difference, but. Sure. Today, that's not the case. Well, all. depends on the DAW. Most DAWs are going to have you multiple choices. One yes. DAW has multiple choices, but it's based upon whether or not you're using their summing buses. <laughs> and yep. You got to know what that summing bus is capable of doing and what its pan law is. So they don't really give it in their documentation, which is a little bit frustrating. But knowing yeah. that the API is one type of board and the Neve is another type of board, that's two different pan laws most likely. <laughs> yeah, if they really, really went into that that nerd level but and knowing that's universal thing. audio, they probably did. Of course yeah. they did. Yeah. Of course they did. So, so. yeah, and, and that would have been, you know, a part of a big impact of the sound, so. Yep. Yeah. And with that, All right. why don't we move on yeah. to a Friday finds, Mr. Chris. What have you got this week? Well, as we talked about gear and everything last week, right? How we shouldn't always go out and get the newest, shiniest toy. I've discovered a new little toy this week. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is from Unfiltered Audio. They have a plugin called Lo Fi AF. And everybody knows what probably AF stands for. But it is a new sort of distortion and sound mangling toy or tool i should say it's not it isn't it to a toy at all it is a tool <laughs> and it looks to me as a um, little bit of a sleeker version of trash too mm. 
because it has, you know, it has the usual bit crushing, it has distortion, all those things, but it also has that convolution engine in there. Mm. But instead of jumping through different menus and things, it's all laid out in one window. Nice. And it's like, yeah, it's cool. Could you do everything else with just multiple plugins? Yeah, of course you could. But that's always the case, isn't it? I thought it looked really intriguing. I'm going to think long and hard about this. If I, this is one that is going to end up in my arsenal. We'll see. But uh, <laughs> that has to be my find for uh, this Friday anyway. What I, about you? I imagine it's going in your arsenal whether we say it or not because your wallet's probably already half open with the money sneaking out to go to unfiltered audio. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if it hasn't already. My find this week for me is a song called Side Effects by Carly Hansen. Okay, I have been cool. jamming on this song for the last week and a half, couple of weeks, and it is oh, stupid catchy. And in terms of the lyrics, it's got a really cool concept of like this person who has fallen in love with someone else without the intent of doing so. And isn't that always the case though? Right. And instead of like admitting it they're trying to withdraw themselves from the relationship in a sense and in doing so they are experiencing side effects which normally you'd think side effects come from taking drugs and she's relating the concept of love to the concept of taking drugs and when she's trying to remove herself from the situation she's experiencing side effects ah. in addition to the lyrics being nice and clever and we all know how being clever can work out the sonic juiciness of this track is really, really amazing. And I just want to give a shout out to the guys that are in the production area of this. And that would include the vocal producer, Mitch Allen, and the vocal engineer, Caleb Hulin. In terms of like how the song comes across, I'm going to give shout outs to the people that are also involved with this, like M Phases who helped co-write it as well, as did Mitch Allen. He's responsible for the programming of the track. And then you've got your mix engineer, Jason Joshua. Shout out to you, dude. And then mastering engineer, Chris Geringer. All these guys have like come together and really put together a track that is pretty damn cool. In I'm intrigued now. I'm going to have to go listen to that. You do. It, it's actually, it's just, it's stupid catchy and it's really good and it sounds sonically awesome. It's just a really good song. And now I'm like sounding like a real nerd when it comes to all of this stuff. So let's move on while we have well, your you attention. Know what? No, what? Before we catch everybody's attention, if you haven't been paying attention, we've been kind of nerding out for the better part of like a half hour. So don't feel too bad, Jody. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. While we've got your attention, we'd like to ask you to go to the website and sign up for our email list at insidetherecordingstudio.com, which the sign up form is pretty much on every single page there. So no matter where you go, you can find a place to sign up. Once you do, do that, it. you will get some presets from Chris and I for various things from Slate Digital and Universal Audio. You get weekly reminders about the current show that has just been released and the current Tuesday tip. Plus, we'll make sure you don't miss any future episodes. And in addition to that, you get a little bit of history between Chris and I on how we kind of came up in this whole industry. And if you send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at insidetherecordingstudio.com with the word panning, you'll get something cool back in your inbox. And if you have a topic of suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, you can reach out to us on the contact page at the website, and we'll put it into rotation for a future episode. And with that, I'll say see you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have an awesome day, Joey.